it's not a hedge pod unless we go off to a side tangent at least once. Tangents uh, are fun. Anyway, so we <laughs> back to the very. Uh, I want to go. I'm gonna go back to the tangent. Hello, this is HedgePod, a podcast about how the mass media reinforces the cultural hegemony of the ruling class. I'm Athena, my pronouns are she, they. And I'm Izzy, uh, she, her, it, it. And today we are going to be talking about a very big, weighty topic, which is autism and the hegemony that surrounds it. And before we even get too much into it, I really want to put this disclaimer out there in case no one gets to the end of this episode. Do not police autistic people on what they call themselves. There is plenty of discourse in the actual autistic community about it. They don't need your help if you're neurotypical or not part of the autistic community. Don't. (laughs) Uh, That's part of the problem is the constant talking over and policing autistic people. So stop. So anyway. Like, Like with many problems in our world, listen to the people who are being, you know, punched down upon. Right, and that is going to be our theme probably throughout this episode. So, before we can even get into the media, we have to look at the history of autism and it being separated into categories. And the best place to start with that is our good old friend, Hans Asperger. So, you might be familiar with the term Asperger's. It is something that has been used to distinguish someone who is autistic who is considered nowadays high functioning. We'll get more into high functioning and low functioning in a minute. But information finally came out in 2018 that the doctor who was in Vienna during the height of World War II probably collaborated with Nazis. Like, we're talking about best case scenario? He used it to further his career. That, that's best case scenario, is he used the eugenics and the, the Jewish people getting thrown from their positions as doctors to further his career. Like, that, that is the best case scenario. He has had a hand in the death of a lot of autistic children in Vienna during World War II. Amongst which, I believe, if I remember reading correctly, recommending them, rec- er, recommending various autistic children to various hospitals known for, like, euthanization type practices, I believe? Yes, he would tell the Nazis where these children were, and, or he would send children to a particular hospital, or something to that effect, and it was known as, like, the hospital that people get killed at, or something to that effect. I, I have, we have resources, but what I have on, um, my notes, he at least collaborated with Nazis, and Chizek found a Nazi party file that vouched for Asperger's loyalty, even though he was not a member. He also found talks Asperger gave, as well as his medical case files and notes. So that's how this information has come to light, is we have a decent amount of information that this is a thing. This is part of the hegemony. From the very beginning, you have this person who was lauded as this great figure for the autistic community and no one thought maybe maybe we shouldn't really listen to this person until we maybe have concrete evidence whether or not the doctor in nazi vienna was a nazi who did eugenics which was very big with the nazis so this is something that kind of a big deal very popular (laughs) very big it it is just i don't know how you can get more hegemonic than that lorna wing is the person who decided to coin the term asperger for high functioning autistic people and i don't i didn't put the year in but about i think it was about the 70s when she did this and lorna wing is an interesting person and i know that i'm going to make some people uncomfortable by saying that she was problematic. She did a decent amount for the autistic community, but she also was a mom of an autistic child. If you do not know, the whole mom of the autistic child is kind of an issue. Um, They speak for their child. They don't ever... Mm -hmm. It's, it, they turn it into a them thing. It's about them. Their child is a burden. I, I'll, I'll talk more about this later, but it won't be uncommon to hear the whole, like, this child was given to me by God to overcome a challenge. She 
kind of hits some of these boxes. And I think it's really interesting too that, so she introduced high functioning and low functioning, but then she did later push for ASD to be considered a spectrum, which it should be. That, that's, that's a good change of perspective. Right, but I will say I did watch an interview with her in her later life, and she's still kind of like all over the place. Where she she's very hit or miss. I I feel like that is the most fair way to present her, is she's either pushing the boundaries and helping people rethink these things, or she's reinforcing this idea that autistic people are not people. Even they're either something to be exploited or they're useless for exploitation so they should be gotten rid of. And to enforce that too, I want to go back to Asperger because I think this is a good summation to this, is Asperger described in one of the recent things that we found the behavior of children with autism as being in opposition to the Nazi party values. For instance, a typical child interacts with others as an integrated member of his community, quote unquote, he wrote, but one with autism follows his own interests with quote unquote, without considering restrictions or prescriptions imposed from the outside. So from the very beginning, we have this idea that autistic people are dangerous because we can't control them. They're not compliant to our authority and the rules we set in place because most people are just going to be like, oh yeah, those are the rules. Right, exactly. And a lot of autistic people have a very like we we question things because we, sometimes we don't understand but we're also very big at pointing out contradictions like because it's why is it this way you know i experienced this a lot growing up around fox news with my father you know the contradictions are countless and it's like well wait you you said this one moment but now you're saying this the other moment and these things don't make sense so what's going on here and this is very dangerous for authoritarians or any sort of type of hierarchical structure because you, you, you can't question the hierarchical structure because that's where some of the power comes into play. I really want to stress how much all of this is connected. It's just, it's just such a deep-rooted structure of hegemony that I will say is starting to change, but it's still there and you'll still even see it in the autistic community. Yeah, you still get a lot of people, uh, myself having been guilty of this for a while, like still people still following that sort of high functioning, low functioning like dichotomy, even as the ASD spectrum really got like, you know, pushed into the field. Like, I don't know, I, fe I feel like ASD spectrum got pushed out like and got wider acceptance more towards what, like 2014, 2015, like mid 2010s. Like even though it was introduced earlier on, it finally started seeing at least mainstream traction around then, but you still see people even today utilizing that, you know, high functioning, low functioning dichotomy. Right, and there's a lot of reasons to this. Now, when I first started this, I will admit this is a topic that is very dear to me, obviously for the personal reasons, and I started off with it very angry and whatnot, and, and, and some frustrations with the autistic community itself. But I've, I've come to know that there's a lot of nuance here, like with a lot of things. And first of all, autistic people also have a hard time with change. So you get comfortable with something and it can be very hard to change. And, you know, that that's... And, and autistic people, you know, on top of everything else, you, I, I saw a meme of this and it kind of made me rethink of some things. And that's, you know, you're, you're dealing with so much stuff and now you're throwing in something else that seems almost superfluous on top of that, which is a name change. Now, it is important, but in comparison to all of the other trauma that's going on, it almost seems laughable. That doesn't change the fact that we are using a word to describe a, a problematic system and that name is I'm gonna call him a Nazi because in my opinion he was a Nazi so we need to move away from that but the better thing would probably be to phase it out and I think there's a bigger problem with doctors and psychiatrists who still use those terms and use high functioning and low functioning and to further get into high functioning because like why why is that a big deal why is that a big deal well you have to understand that it's a spectrum. So you need to think of it more on how much 
support you need and where you need that support like the, it, the better way to think of autism isn't this binary like a lot of things in life please stop thinking about everything in binaries anyway but instead one of the best things i saw to describe it was imagine like you have a bunch of sliders and each person has a different slider combination on uh, sensory issues, hyper-focusing, and all of these type of things that are under the autism umbrella. So someone who is considered high-functioning has can be denied help, or it can still be very difficult for them to get help. However, the flip side to this is someone who is considered low-functioning, quote-unquote, could be decently efficient in a lot of different things, but they need a little bit more help here and there, and because of that, instead they get this cookie-cutter build on how to be helped, and their autonomy gets stripped away from them. Uh, think of a more severe case of, like, the whole Britney Spears fiasco. That is something- now, I, I'm mentioning autism here, but this is a issue with- that a lot of uh, people with disabilities face, is this robbing of autonomy. And it's not always just, like, a single person enacting this on someone. It can be something as simple as the lack of public transportation. That is a robbing of autonomy for- for people who can't drive. And I think that's something that's important to remember, but that is why high functioning and low functioning is considered an issue here. It's also a, a thing where the high functioning, low functioning dichotomy places a value judgment and like worth indicator upon those particular, particular sections of the autism spectrum, because even with Asperger and his whole like you know research and stuff the whole dealio with of trying to identify high functioning autism was so that you could get you know good little professors and you know the good like you know good autistic children who would be really smart and efficient and like that whole you know like oh the really smart intelligent autistic person started way back then even then trying to identify you know oh who's going to be valuable to us in this society in these functions and then who's low function who can we just kick off the bus you're right exactly it's it's all about these labels were not created by autistic people these labels were created by neurotypicals to place these values and these quick easy okay this person can be exploited by their labor or whatnot, and we don't need to give them that much help. And this person over here needs more help, so we're and we're not going to be able to exploit them as much, so get rid of them. And I think that might be a good segue into the next part, which is the actual media. What does good and bad autism have to do with hegemony with media well first off i think we need to go i i've mentioned this in previous episodes but because i know people would come at me with like well that it's not official that this person is neurodivergent it's like okay of course not because people want to save face <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you do this it, it's the same thing as like quote unquote queer coding back in the day right like that's what's happening now is you have neurodivergent coded and it really just benefits the movie makers and TV show makers, etc., because then they can they can make it fit more with what they want it to be. So neurodivergent coded is basically taking a person, a character, and making them neurodivergent through actions and things like that that they do without ever putting an official pin on it. Sometimes it's not even, like, conscious. The the amount of times you've, like, oh, that person, they're neat or whatever, but they're quirky, they're probably neurodivergent. Every time you hear the word, oh, quirky character, good chance that they're neurodivergent somehow. Mm -hmm. So, with that, I'm gonna go into the, what I consider two main depictions with, like, a subcategory with the bad, and that's there's the good autism in media, and then there's the bad autism in media with the category of danger, specifically with horror. So, you are either a super genius, or you are a hindrance, and everyone secretly wants you dead. Like, th those are- and it's that severe of a binary most of, of the time. There's few examples recently where someone is more genuinely 
just existing, but it's pretty rare. I, I want to say, I think we can also find here the, like, punched down at for comedy sake. Yeah. Because we, cause we had talked previously at one point about um, Spongebob being, like, you know, a, a pretty a, a autistically coded character. And Spongebob is def definitely falls into that more, like, comedic, you know, like, kind of punched down upon for their, like, foolishness, for their silly behavior and stuff. Yeah, that's a good example of that. The big category is, I call this the hindrance, and it needs to be stated, I'm while we're mostly focusing on autism, other disabilities and other neurodivergencies also falls into these issues a lot of times, uh, especially with the whole hindrance trope. And basically, these type of shows or movies, the family is, they're, they're the valiant family, and they have to stop and take care of this mentally incapable person or physically incapable person, and it's just, you know, to, to keep them alive and to do this is such a great kindness from the family. The family secretly wants them dead, but they have to, like, you know, grow past that and understand that, you know... The social ostracization that having such a weird child gives us is so ghastly and abominable. Like, oh, if only things were better if, like, you weren't here. Right, exactly. But... Hey, and that it goes back into that whole thing. It's like, God has given us this challenge to overcome. I, I hope I don't need to explain how this takes a lot of agency from, like, the person's a prop at this point. Like, they're... They're, they're a MacGuffin. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're basically a MacGuffin. They're almost like a pet to be taken care of, like, at the expense of the family. But even less so because pets provide loving and stuff like that and these people are not going to be depicted as that they're going to be depicted as incapable of love and the fun part to these type of of uh depictions is the person will normally either die unexpectedly or will be magically cured uh which is a whole other thing i'm glad to say i don't think i've seen any of that second kind and i don't know if i want to <laughs> Right, like, that's a whole other can of worms, and they would need a whole other episode to go into that pitfall, but I, I actually, I read about it recently, and it was something I was like, oh yeah, that is a thing. Now, mind you, this is, I feel like the cure thing is more for other types of disabilities, but they're, they're, it's a very problematic idea. It's, it's ableist. It's literally ableist, like... And, and that isn't to say that there isn't people who, like, don't want to have these things happen to them anymore, not have these issues. Like, that's not what I'm saying. But it's, it doesn't come from them. It comes from, once again, the neurotypicals who view, it's almost selfish. Like, I don't mm -hmm. know how else to put it. Because it's not about that person who has their own shit that they're going through. It's always about everyone else. And, and that, yeah, it's just... It's always about everyone else. It's never about the autistic people or any other person with a disability. It's, they're, they're just a prop. Yeah, it's focusing upon, like, the family struggle and all that jazz. Mm -hmm. And then that leads to the subcategory of this, which is the dangerous. And this is really prolific in the horror movie industry. It's gotten better but it's still pretty bad, especially with your classics, uh, your slashers and whatnot. The person is almost always someone who broke out of a mental in institution or whatever. I mean, that's literally the start of Halloween. Or is in some way disabled thinking uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah. I'm, I'm not a huge horror buff, but that is one I've seen that is like, oh yeah, Chainsaw Mask is, yeah. Leatherface. Butterface, yes. <laughs> I, I'm set because I I'm still fascinated by horror movies, and before you ask, I I don't know why it itches that mythological folklore interest that I have. No, which totally fair, totally fair. Uh, I I watch horror YouTube twenty four seven. Like I watch like video game playthroughs of horror, and I'm getting into playing more of those myself because that is fun and interesting to me. For some reason, I don't drive with. <laughs> I don't jive with horror film, but horror games, yeah, 
And you don't see a lot of this kind of tropes um, in horror video games, really, which is interesting. Yeah, now that you mentioned that, I did not think about that, but horror video games, they all, they're, they're actually more sympathetic, normally. Now, there's exceptions. There's exceptions to everything, yeah. Yeah, normally, like, it'll start out with, oh, here's the trope, but then they, they like, video games like to take the tropes and spin them on their head a lot, and they normally go after the people who are actually problematic. There was a one game that I saw recently that popped up on Slash Art Artism, actually, that was talking about it was from the perspective of this husband who was being very abusive to his daughter and wife because they were autistic and how he was the bad guy. So, hey, good job, video games. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you got something right. <laughs> and I think also a thing that's interesting is that in some ways I feel that horror video games, like, and especially indie horror video games, get a lot more visibility than, like, horror indie film, you know? Because I feel oh, like yeah. the discussion would be a lot more similar, too, if we were able to see a lot more horror indie film, you know? A horror indie film doesn't get a lot of publicity outside of, like, what, the occasional film, like, festival and stuff? Like, films, despite being easier to make, are somehow harder to make and get noticed. Right, because it's such a high production value, because the only... Well, it wasn't indie, though. Like, the only thing I can think of is things that come out of those, like, film festivals. But even mm -hmm. those, like, they're considered tiny, and they still have huge budgets. Like, I yeah. think the... I don't want to... I'm not sure. Like, I know The Witch came out of a, a, of a film festival, but I don't... Mm -hmm. I would not call that small. <laughs> no. I mean, Blair Witch was a small production. But oh, yeah, Blair Witch a... was... Yeah, I, I think we're talking about something different, though. Yeah, oh, no, I, I'm talking about, uh, it, it's just The Witch, it's... Good, good, na good naming, everyone. Well, but see, the, it, it works out, because the W is, it has, like, two Vs on the box, and it's very confusing, so, it's the same people who did The Lighthouse. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, the, the Witch was the first one. Or, as Thought Slime likes to say, The Vivitch, but, anyway, my, The, the Dangerous. Yes, the dangerous. <laughs> it's not a hedge pod unless we go off to a side tangent at least once. Tangents uh, are fun. Anyway, so <laughs> we back to the very. Uh, I want to go. I'm gonna go back to the tangent. <laughs> so, yeah. So another example of this is is like the joke. There, there's been a joke for a while. Uh, this meme and it's the DSM and it's like movie industry people. Is this a monster manual? And they. It's, it's almost hard to pinpoint this specifically on autism because they like to mix and match like a DM going through a monster manual. It's really true. Mm -hmm, like, because mm -hmm. if you're a DM and you want to create a special encounter and none of the monsters fit, what you do, you go in and you pick all of the little traits and things that you like and you throw them into a little mixer and then you create a monster. Like, that's, that's how... <laughs> Hollywood uses the DSM. They go in and they're like, okay, well, let's see, let's get a little bit of bipolar disorder, a little bit of autism, a little bit OCD, mm -hmm. you know, just just pick and choose. Oh, schizophrenia, got gotta get your schizophrenia in there. Those people aren't, you know, gotta get uh, got, gotta enough. get plural in there too. Though plural mm -hmm. isn't even a isn't even technically a like a thing in the DSM. It's just a thing, but that's been demonized there too. Yeah, and what I think is interesting about this category, too, is it's not just Hollywood. Think about, like, all of your folklore around old, abandoned, haunted, abandoned mental facilities, right? Like, even mm -hmm. those, sometimes it's, oh, there was a doctor that was really mean to the patients, and that's why it's haunted. But there's a lot of times when it's like, oh, it's haunted. Well, why? Oh, because that's where all the, pardon me, crazies were. So, that's why it's bad and scary and haunted and it's like no it's actually if it was haunted it's because of all the people who were tortured to death in there so it, it's interesting just how invasive and deep once i mean I've, I've said this before but the roots are deep on this one and it's gonna take mm -hmm. a while to cut the bitch down <laughs> yeah especially since like right now like outside of really conservative media like in regular media like asd people are some of the 
like one of the one, one of the few groups of people left that's like you know still pretty okay to punch down mm -hmm. on like it's it's one that's able to be like just a good punching bag for people to use obviously conservative media doesn't care they're gonna utilize whoever as a punching bag but you know for like more uh, more center left slash left media like you know it's still a perfectly reasonable punching bag because it's still not a thing that's accepted in our neurotypical society right and there's a lot of you know stuff where it's like well why don't you just act this way why don't you my favorite is why don't you just get over it and just grit and bear it and push through and i'll get into why that's problematic in a bit because i'm still suffering from that but this leads us to our final category which is the super genius and that is the 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 person who is once again they're they're still kind of a prop too but you know they're the one they're the techie they're the person who helps the real heroes in trouble they're the eccentric genius there's the the savant which by the way i think it's something like 10 percent of autistic people are savants it's not that high of a just because so the savant thing comes from special interests and a, autistic people have a lot of like well yeah they have a lot of special interests my mm. special interest right now gardening bonsai animals have been my special interest since i was toddling video games etc 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 like it, it's not just like one thing and it's not just trains or coding or things like that you know so this idea that it's like oh but you're so good at this it's like yeah but i still study i still look things up and stuff and yeah that's why outside of those special interests i might not be considered as good because i haven't done any research and i have to do a lot of research to be as good as i am at the things that i am good at yeah we're not a flat character sheet here we're a very min maxed character sheet yeah and society doesn't like that no, because it's like, you have to be kind of good at everything, and the things that you tend to not be good at are things that are very hard for capitalism to exploit. So, like, communication, you know, and being able... The way that neurotypicals speak, which, in my opinion, is, I just, just say what it is that you mean. Just, just, oh, yeah. just say it. Just, do you want, it's like, do you want me to go get the thing? Yes or no? Well, maybe if you want to. It's like, just yes or no. Just, <laughs> I mean, that one actually isn't as problematic. It's more things like, oh, actually, for example, uh, when I was volunteering at a vet office, I was told to put this bedding in one of the horse stalls. And the way that they worded it, it was like, you cannot add too much water, which I took to mean you can't add you can add as much water as you want to and so i ended up putting too much water in there because what she actually meant was you can't add too much water so but that's also that's probably not a good story either uh because i think that one's just generally confusing then again i don't know what do i know what is generally confusing or not everything is generally confusing for me <laughs> that sounds like one of my personal gripes a lack of tone indicators Mm -hmm. A lack of explicit sarcasm indicators, a lack of explicit, like, tone and intent indicators. I will say I'm generally good at sarcasm just because of my mother, who is the queen of sarcasm. Like, when she dies, that will be on her tombstone, the queen of sarcasm. She, she is the queen. <laughs> Yeah, sarcasm is one of my particular faults. I, my sarcasm meter has been broken for forever. I will say it's a lot harder online. Yeah, that's been a thing that has come up a lot in discussions I've had where the internet and, you know, text in general is so particularly neurotypical in that most, like, most fonts, most indicators don't have, like, nothing has anything for, you know, sarcasm or for joking tone. This could totally be a thing because we already have italics and bold and underlines as fonts like changes that we have on the internet, but we don't have stuff like sarcasm, like joking tone. 
we we just don't have that and better and worse yet on some websites twitter and others you don't even have the option to use italics which is ridiculous mm -hmm. and should just be part of the standard because then at least if someone types out an entire message in italics you can probably guess it's either being really inflective or it's being incredibly sarcastic and yeah. we just don't have that because the entire system's not built for that yeah i follow um cody johnston on on twitter and there's so many of his that i'm like I do not understand what is being said here. And I'll go through the comments trying to get an idea, and it's like, it's more of the same. I don't know what's happening here. What is this humor? <laughs> but, uh, at least, like, some people are cool enough to put sarcasm in, like, quotation marks or slash or something. Slash S, please. If you're a, t a title listener, if you're gonna make something be sarcastic, at least put a slash S. Not everyone can read it. And it's the internet. Everyone's, someone's going to come along and not read it correctly, and then they might get mad at you. Like, just for your own sake, put a slash S, please. Yes. Yeah. And my thing, too, is like, I don't think, hey, I forget to do it sometimes, you know? And. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the issue is always, like, if someone comes up to you and says, like, hey, I don't understand, are you being sarcastic or not? Answer genuinely and honestly, don't be an ass. Don't, yeah. Don't be an ass. Just don't be an ass. And also, the one that gets me, the one that gets me, especially in today's day and age that we live in, is satire. Hmm. Like... Holy, especially because there's just new satire websites that keep popping up all over the place. So it was like, The Onion. It's like, okay, The Onion satire. Cool. I understand that. But then, you know, other things, like someone will be like, oh, check this out. And they'll share it to me. And I'm like, this is outrageous. It's like, oh, you silly idiot. Obviously it's satire. That website is satire. It's like, I didn't know that. You shared it to me like it was a normal news site. How am I? And, and it's like, well, it's obviously something that wouldn't happen. We are living year two of a global pandemic. There, the war, We have a fire and flood season in America now. We Practically have, every single Onion article that's been a mockery of life has become real. Right! <laughs> like, The Onion's basically an actual news rag now. And it's just, that's why it's so, like, weird to me that because pe people get really weird about the satire because i'm not saying get rid of satire i'm just saying if someone misunderstands don't be an ass <laughs> and i'm keeping all this in because i think it's related <laughs> but going back to actually before we go back to the main thing i kind of want to say too i think it's important that we say these things because I think it's important for autistic people to share their experiences. Yes. Too long have we been silent. <laughs> <laughs> Silenced. But anyway, now going back to the <laughs> regular schedule program. So, the super genius. Your entraptas. Your futabas. Your, um, what's her face from, uh, Oh, actually, I was almost say what's her face from the criminal show, but there's a lot of them. Um, da -ba -da -ba -da. I I'd also say Twilight Sparkle probably fits in this. That's interesting. I saw a list of of autistic people, and that one came up, and that one that one's interesting to me. Mhm. Mm Your Spencer Reads, I I know that one. Sheldon is probably one of the higher tier right. ones here, though definitely made more a mockery of than allowed to be heroic right man sheldon is a that's a whole can of worms and i'm not equipped to, wa no, to do no. that because i've watched maybe two full episodes of big bang theory in my lifetime and I i've no watched in several seasons more. okay it's uh it's one of those some there is one scene where or this one episode where he goes and retires to at the same time every day he locks himself into this room in the basement and mm -hmm. his friends keep bugging him about it and they keep trying to sneak in there to figure out like because it's sheldon so it's got to be something 
and eventually just he 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 does this elaborate prank on them basically because of it and he says hey look i i know you all it's like i'm the super genius or whatever but hey i need to just exist sometimes so please just respect my boundaries and respect whatever it is that i'm doing down here and it turns out like the camera like goes there later and it's like he's playing hacky sack like in this room and honestly that is the i'm not gonna say the only but that is the best thing from that show because i relate to it as someone who has snuck like to their car during college to take naps it's it's a thing it's very overwhelming to be in this world but once again trying to stay on topic your your super geniuses are i know some people would be like well what's the problem they're they're super geniuses they're so cool except even in some of the best case scenarios they're still props they still only exist to serve a purpose and even the people that are supposed to be their close friends and whatnot view them as a means to an end they have to put up with their pardon me craziness to get what it what what they want from this person they do not value this person as a human being most of the time it is what they can provide for them and everything past that any hopes and dreams for this individual they don't give a shit. and then there's also the infantile infantilizing of mm -hmm. um various asd people in media yeah I, I saw a thing that the stereotypical autistic person in media is going to be a straight white boy who's a beanpole mm -hmm. and yeah i'll i'll get more into that later but yeah so actually i guess that's basically those are the three categories and it's you, you have to understand what it's like. like. Even if you are not diagnosed with autism until later in life, I can assure you, growing up with these depictions are still harmful because you recognize yourself in these characters. You recognize yourself as yeah. the quirky person. And then you realize if you're not useful, if you, if you cannot provide to capitalism, if you cannot be useful to these people they will discard you and that is a type of stress that i can't i cannot express it's it's like i saw another thing too and it's like so we have our special interests and when someone comes to you and asks you something about your special interest that you don't know it almost feels like you failed because oh no this was my one chance to be useful and i failed and that happens to me all the time now i'm not saying don't ask questions and whatnot but it's this is the type of stuff that we go through is this and and i'm not saying that we don't ever want to be useful or anything like that but it's it's that pressure you know like you can't ever you can't ever be a problem. You have to make the neurotypicals happy. You have to make them comfortable. It's all about them. You you have to do everything according to what they want. And it sucks. A lot. <laughs> you can never be... <laughs> You're, like, I've been trying to take off the mask more, and I'll get more into masking in a minute, too. The next section's gonna be really long. But, you, you, I've been trying to unmask, and it's like this fear that I'm gonna drive everyone away from me. And, and that's another fear, too, that I, I've seen a lot of autistic people express, which is this fear of abandonment. And that exists because of these things. Because it's perpetrated everywhere. You either serve or you get served to the wolves. But that leads to the final section, which is where do we go from here? And this is where I would like to talk a little bit more. We've, we've done so a little bit about what it means to be autistic in this world. And I have a bunch of stats up. And here's... Let me explain masking real fast, because that's going to be important. Yeah, go. So, everyone masks to a certain degree. Masking is basically, the, the easiest way to describe it is your customer 
persona that you put on when you're working or having to go outside and deal with another human being that you don't know. It's that little bit of fakeness that you put on to, and it's not necessarily fake all the time per se, but it is, it is an act. It is a mask. That extreme politeness for that one person you don't like. Yeah. And for autistic people, it's practicing your speaking ability in the mirror when no one's looking. It's having the fake arguments, but trying to, you know, remember how to move correctly to make everyone feel better. It's trying to keep eye contact with someone despite your entire body just wanting to run away because of it. And then you don't understand what's being said to you because you're too busy trying to appear human, which is shitty because we are human. That's what masking is. And it is another way to put it too. And I, I put, there'll be many links. Um, there's this video of this, I think he's a professor who was talking about burnout and autism masking specifically. And he describes it how, mm -hmm. uh, take a baby. If, if a baby cries or needs something, they cry. And what happens? They get picked up, they get coddled, they, they get fed, they get touched a lot. What happens to that baby if being touched hurts them? At first, they cry, and then they go through the whole process that babies go through. Eventually, that baby is going to learn if they don't cry as much, they won't be touched, and they will not have to put up with these things. That's what masking is for an autistic person. There are times when, like, we it's not a conscious decision a lot of times. It's just something we have learned to do to survive. I've mentioned this elsewhere. I'm not sure if it was in an episode or not, but I have a knack of copying speech patterns and movements. I cannot stop myself from doing it completely, but... It, it's not, I've never consciously told myself, hey, this person is speaking like this. I need to try and do that. No, it just happened one day and my partner eventually just pointed it out to me and it was like, oh my God, I do this everywhere. You, Do you know how quick I start mimicking Thought Slime after I watch one of their videos? It's almost instant, <laughs> that one. So it can be just super subconscious and it's just very intensive and i guess i'll go ahead and lead with this since I'm, I'm talking about it but it can lead to what is considered or what is called autistic burnout and the other word for it is autistic regression i'm not sure how i feel about that word would like more discourse on if this word is the best or not but this is what i've gone through and it sucks it's not like normal burnout. I have lost abilities. I have lost the ability to do things. I have lost motor functioning because of this burnout. And, you know, I, I'm not going to get into it completely because it happened in college and it, it's what led me down the journey that I, I am here today because I couldn't do things. And it's interesting because it's how I, I first, I do have ADHD, which that's a fun combo. Um, ADHD and autism, but... Very comorbid. Yeah. That's what it got labeled as, like, okay, so this is why I'm going through this. But then, as I, you know, it's like, okay, I have autism, and I start doing research and stuff. This came up, and it just almost took the wind out of me because of how perfectly it describes the things that have not made any sense. Because autistic burnout slash regression is you either temporarily, semi-permanently, or permanently lose abilities and masking capabilities that you had previously. It is harder for me to keep eye contact now than it was previously. It is easier for me to be overwhelmed by things that were only a minor inconvenience. And um, I drop things more now. Uh, I, I bump into things more now. It's... I, I, it's one of those things that I cannot put into words how much my life has degraded because of these things. Because I didn't... I've, I've talked a lot about this with my partner, and it's... The ways that we put it is... Um, when we, we've been talking, is that it's kind of like... You, 
you've been walking around with a crutch for a long time, but it wasn't really a crutch. It was more like something you put together with garbage and stuff to try and get through life. And then it broke and it hurt you by how much it broke. So now you're worse off than you were before the crutch almost <laughs> because I didn't right. learn healthy coping mechanisms. And that's, that's the key thing is I didn't learn healthy coping mechanisms because, because there's a big difference between coping through life with a mental disability incorrectly versus a more healthy way of doing it. Because of that, I will never be able to mask to the same ability that I have. And I, I'm waiting for the day someone tells me that, oh, you act differently than you used to. It's like, mm-hmm, yeah. <laughs> but th this type of stuff is, and, and I want to talk about, and the reason why I'm spending time on this is because there's not a lot of stuff on this. There's not a lot of research on this. But if you go to the autistic community, you'll find lots of people who have been through this, who are going through this. Hi, I'm one I of see, them. I see anecdotes and memes about this all the time in my Twitter circles. Mm -hmm. Like, and of course, Twitter circles being largely trans femmes of some kind. And it's shitty because there's no research on this. The, the one place where a lot of autistic people agree, hey, we need research on this, nothing. It's a, a tumbleweed in the wind. Nothing. And I wouldn't be surprised if you start really start poking and prodding the academic community to, hey, look into this. They'd be like, eh, you're all faking it. But here's the thing, like, and, and this is what I originally wanted to get to with this, is I realize now, and it took me a while to realize this, but... I'm here in this way because of how often I just grit and bore through it. I just, you know, I, I, I did what they said. I got over it and I just did it anyway. I did that. And look where I am now. I am worse off now for doing that. So, mm -hmm. and I mean this as politely as I can. If you tell people to do that, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> say it yeah so now this leads this was originally further down but my thoughts here are pretty scattered anyway but this leads me to the point that being autistic is dangerous if you have asd you're three times more likely to attempt suicide than those without and i would go as far as far as to say that most autistic people have contemplated or at least thought about suicide at least once in their life. Hi, I'm one of them. Luckily, didn't, but now I live out of spite. Um, I think that's important. Uh, <laughs> but I, I also, I have a lot of people in my life who have allowed me to live a life worth living. And that's a privilege, and I fucking hate that that's a privilege. It should not be a privilege to be alive, period. Moving on to the next point, which is our favorite group of people, the cops. And by favorite, I mean fuck them. A cab forever. A cab forever. Approximately one in five adults with autism spectrum disorder will interact with a police officer before the age of 21. Individuals with disabilities, including those with autism, are five times more likely to be incarcerated than people without disabilities. Additionally, police interactions lead to more injuries and fatalities with these vulnerable populations, largely due to lack of training and the improper use of excessive force from the Autism Society. We'll get more into organizations at the end here. But now, take that what I just said and add intersectionality to it. And going back to burnout and everything, intersectionality is key here because despite all the stuff that I've been through, I'm white. If you are black with autism, the chances of your survival is just almost unfathomable how low it is. Just this year in Oklahoma, we had one big instance of a cop just 
shooting a black person who was standing in someone's yard looking up at the sky. Like, that was all that they were doing. They, they obviously had something going on, and that's how they were treated. And I, and I, I guarantee you there, were, there are more instances than that one, but that was the one that made the news. It, intersectionality is, is just so important here because black people are also less likely to be diagnosed with autism because yep. this goes into uh, medical racism. Because if a black person has a mental disability, they are more likely to be diagnosed with oppositional defiance disorder. That's the case, is there are a lot of black people who have autism that are not going to be diagnosed. And there's going to probably be even more autistic women who will not be diagnosed than, um, than black autistic boys because there's also a gender issue there too because, yeah, you know... Women are drastically less diagnosed for various right. reasons. Part of which probably being, you know, oh, you know, the quieter, like, you know, more introspective type thing. That's like, you know, good emotional behavior exactly. for a woman. Exactly. If you... Like, and I, I would go as far as to say, too, that if you were a more extroverted autistic person or other uh, mental disability, then you're going to be more likely to get that curbed in you as um, a young girl because of what is considered proper and whatnot, you know? Like, you run around and be loud and whatnot. It's like, no, you can't be loud. It's okay for that little boy to be loud. But you can't be loud. And it, this is an issue, too, with uh, ADHD as well. So you... It's not uncommon for a little girl who used to be pretty wild and carefree and whatnot to get pigeonholed into acting these certain ways because of uh, sexism. But add intersectionality into there, and I would almost imagine that every um, black woman who gets diagnosed with autism is a miracle. And I say a miracle because if... <sighs> Understanding that you have these things is important. It honestly helps with your mental health in a weird way because you understand what's, what's going, going on. on. And that's... Like, you understand the problem at hand. Right. And, and you, can, you can start getting the appropriate tools. You can stop trying to hit everything with like, it, like it's a nail because all you have is a hammer. You can get other tools now. I can absolutely guarantee that I would not have had as nearly a solid childhood nor schooling life, especially going to university, if I had not understood the framework that I was on the autism spectrum. Like, if I hadn't understood that, then I wouldn't have been able to have the framework to realize that, oh, I'm feeling shitty right now because I'm in a loud, like, crowded space, and that's really getting to me right now. Like, this student union is really loud right now, and I just need to go. Like, I don't think I would have had that kind of framework to understand that if I didn't know I was on the autism spectrum. As someone speaking on the flip side of that, I can assure that, yeah, that's a thing. <laughs> like, not, not understanding it can make everything worse, and that leads to burnout. And if, if you are black or other ethnicities too, you're going to more likely burn out because you can never stop masking. Think about that. If you are a black man, you can't stim in public because you're going to make people like freak out because everyone fucking sucks. They're going to see you as a threat because you're, you know, twirling something around because people fucking suck. Like... Mm -hmm. So any ethnicity that has these problems, like, in perception, they're going to have this issue where they're going to be required to mask more and mask more in intensely, which leads to more intense burnout. It's just, that's just how the cycle is. And it fucking sucks. And I think this is a good segue into the next bit which is the autism community itself once again if you're neurotypicals listen and learn do not police people for the most part things are moving forward 
I, I notice that there's pushes to get past the problematic terms that we're using, but another issue that we are working through is diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So you would think that if you know in your heart of hearts that you have autism, that it would be just like that to go get a diagnosis, right? Oh, hell you're wrong. Like, <laughs> it's really difficult to get a diagnosis, even if you're white. If you yeah. are not white, once again, op op oppositional defiance disorder, uh, all that shit, you just run into these issues, right? So, and it costs money. It costs a decent amount of Well, I should say, you can potentially get the diagnosis from a doctor covered by your insurance. Maybe it's a, if you're in America, it's a shit show, right? We, everyone's heard the horror stories at this point. Help us. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Working from an American framework, it's hard as hell. Right. Like, I, I, like, I know I'm ASD, and I've known for a long time, because my mom figured it out, and, but I don't actually, and I know, and I've known, we, we were classified, uh, she had classified me under Asperger's way back when, but, like, I don't actually know if I was ever officially diagnosed, like, that's the kind of situation that you deal with, is that you might fully know, but you just never end up getting one because of material circumstances. Right. And... If, if you're a woman, you're also really likely to have them laugh in your face and say, women don't get autism and send you packing. And I'm not kidding. You can find the stories about these things. Like yep, th yep, yep. And then you add, what if you need help? It's like, well, you're high functioning. So you don't, you don't need to be on disability or anything like that. It's like, I, okay, I can't work normally. Like I can't work a nine to five or anything like that without dying, which some people would probably say good. But that, that's the problem we're, we're looking at here with, with this stuff. And be, because of this, there are people in the autistic community that believe that diagnosis is everything. Diagnosis is the holy grail of everything. And it's not. <laughs> uh, someone pointed out, and I, I really agree with this, is like, if you think about it, diagnosis is someone who has an education in this, and that should be respected if they are a person to be respected, examines you, watches what you do, and then takes those things and then compares it to a list and then says you have autism or not. Like, there's nothing that's like, oh yeah, you have this protein or something, so you have autism. Like, there's nothing like that. And until we fix the state of the world, I hope we don't have it anytime soon for discrimination reasons and eugenics. Probably get more on that later. Yeah, even when, even if you manage to get a diagnosis, like, that often still isn't going to provide you many resources. If you're at the university level, some universities, like, do have, you know, allowances for, you know, assisting with ASD and other disabilities, but the wider world, even if you have a diagnosis, like, there's resources out there, but there's not that many. Like, you're still going to be dealing with a lot of the same problems, even if you get an official diagnosis. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, anyway. Like, I've never heard much in the way of, like, you know, oh, well, after getting my diagnosis, XYZ, like, happened, and it was great. Like, I've heard maybe a little bit, but I've not heard a whole lot around that kind of stuff of, you know, after I get a diagnosis, you know, you know, things got better. Like, right, and you can be discriminated against if you get a diagnosis. Yeah. And this kind of leads back to why some people have a hard time getting rid of high-functioning, low-functioning Asperger labels. It's a symptom. It's a symptom of the hegemony because people have mentioned how if they put autism on a resume, they're less likely to get hired. If they put Asperger's on a resume, then they are more likely to get hired. That's a problem. That's a big fucking problem. And it leads further into this idea, and this is a problem, and it's a decent enough problem, which is internalized ableism in the autistic community. And it's something that I hope 
everyone works through and it, it's a hard thing to work through but there will be people who will use Asperger's specifically as a way to be like oh no I'm not autistic I have Asperger's they are removing themselves as much as they can there's also been a similar kind of trend of people like you know labeling themselves as like you know here are some things this has been happening on TikTok um so like this is anecdotal third party from seeing clips on Twitter but of you know people being like if you have these symptoms like da 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 like here's some symptoms then you might be ADHD and like half of those over half of the symptoms are like that's just autism honey like that's just straight up ASD but it's like younger people still trying to remove themselves from the stigma mm -hmm. of autism spectrum even now yeah like it's still that kind of you know trying to divulge it because you know ADHD has less of a stigma even now compared to autism yeah like it was a lot easier for me to come out with ADHD than with autism I still haven't told everyone uh, that I know that I have autism because I don't want to deal with them I got too much other shit to deal with I don't want to go through that song and dance yeah Ugh. God, especially my I'm not getting into that anyway <laughs> <laughs> that is something that and it's being worked on but it would be easier probably if people would stop being dickheads to autistic people <laughs> like if that discrimination wasn't there it would be a lot easier for people to be comfortable with being called autistic and which is one of the reasons why we're doing this I guess is a little bit of a move on but I, I do want to say too because this pops up too what and that what autism isn't it's not racism it's not being um, LGBT plus phobic it's not it's not these things it's not fascist it's if, if someone or is these things and autistic they are those things because they are those things not because they're autistic and it because the these type of things crop up everywhere and surprise surprise the autistic community is a bit bigger than a lot of people realize and understand so like any group of people we have to be very you know aware of these issues and in our quest to be inclusive we have to be careful of those who would turn around and then be exclusive there are more neurotypicals and uh, neurodiverse people out there than you might think mm-hmm once again every time it's like oh that person's quirky mm-hmm now I'm not saying everyone who's quirky is neurodivergent but there's a decent chance <laughs> I think that leads us to one of our final issues and that is groups that advocate quote unquote advocate for autistic people do you want to do you want to leave that one yeah yeah <laughs> I'll I'll take it on from here I have shorter notes so there are better organizations out there I don't have the other organizations out out here actually no uh, look for the autistic women's network look for neurodiversity look for autistic self-advocacy network there are other autism like awareness and you know research networks out there that are trying to do good stuff out there please for the love of the stars and everything do not give a sense or a piece of your mind the autism speaks for the love of everything mm -hmm. Autism Speaks, for those who are not aware, is a, I, I believe it's an American-based um, autism research and awareness uh, charity that is focused on, you know, trying to help, like, autist-having parents, you know, deal with the suffering and the trauma of having a child, calling back to that stuff that we've had previously. They're horrendous for a number of reasons, primarily amongst which is that they're very, like, strongly in favor of the elimination of autistic peoples. Um, they've, so they're uh, primarily 
like <laughs> almost explicitly eugenics based com like mm -hmm. charity um, they, especially around the time of the whole MMR vaccine, like, and sort of the beginning of the anti-vax movement, they were right there uh, promoting and supporting that ideology, supporting, you know, the idea that, oh, you know, you give too many vaccines to your child as a kid, and then they're going to become autistic. Like, they were right there pushing that narrative, pushing that line. Um, back in those early days. They've since denied it, but that means nothing. Um, no organization is worth their word, not anymore. And so beyond just promoting the anti-vax movement, even up to very recently, they've been trying to, especially as COVID has gone on, try to distance themselves from that narrative, but they have been prevalent in that. The other thing that they have promoted is the idea of trying to find the autism gene this obsession that somehow autism is tied to like a genetic code in some way and maybe it is i don't know i don't frankly give a damn because what their end goal there is to you know help you know find and you know eventually you know eliminate that gene if possible and you know help cure autistic people which is sickening to even think about because like it's it not to draw too heavy of a comparison but if slash when they ever find you know a um the uh, a slash the slash uh, the many autism genes then we will likely see a heavy increase in and if they can get prenatal detection of that then that means we will see some like forced like abortions um, around that time, similar to that how it already occurs for Down syndrome peoples. I found a article from Medium that f said that in the U.S., 67% of pregnancies uh, that had Down syndrome uh, were terminated. In France, it was 77, and in Denmark, it was 98%. Damn. I wasn't I wasn't able to find a source on that, but that is insane numbers. And this isn't a sort of thing where like they've, you know, talked about, you know, trying to find the autism gene way back. This is recent. There was an article uh, just just uh, earlier this year um, where Google has partnered with Autism Speaks on a program called MSSNG, um, also known as Aut10K, which is trying to make a global genetic database on autism to try and identify that gene. So like this is an ongoing thing that they're trying to work on and find. So like they take in a, a lot of money. Most of it is, you know, spent towards uh, like promoting their brand image and stuff. Cause like how many cop cars have you seen with the Autism Speaks logo on it? I've seen too many. Which is the puzzle um, piece. Yes, it's the Puzzle Piece logo. If any of you have seen the Puzzle Piece logo, that is the Autism Speaks logo. And some people, when they wield that, are meaning, well, but Autism Speaks isn't a good organization. That's that's the long and short of what I have to say on them. Yeah, the, the current logo we use right now is the Affinity Rainbow logo. So you see that, you're probably well you're at least with people who are meaning well mm -hmm. to add to what you were saying like the another way to think about this is imagine a group like imagine a group for queer liberation that wasn't run for queer people then it wouldn't be for liberation i can tell you that you know it it's a group for advocating for stuff that isn't run by the people who it's advocating for um, that interview I watched uh, with uh, uh, Lorna Wing, she, it, it was her and this other doctor, and it was, it made me want to scream, because it was these two people who were talking like autistic people are all two and three year olds who can't speak for themselves. You know, it's enraging. Like, this is the part where, like, my anger really starts coming up, because we're here. We can speak for ourselves, and mm -hmm. even, because there's nonverbal autistic people, but, like, 
they should still be met on their own needs, not based off of what you think is best for them. Like... Yeah. And, and that's another thing, too, because, like, some of the... Oddly enough, some of the criticisms I see for people who want... Uh, against people who want to stop with the high-functioning and low-functioning is, well, not... It's not fair to compare the two. It's like, no one's wanting to compare these two. People just want people to have a better idea of how autism works and get the help that they need. And I, I will say some of this is a bit bigger than autism. Because if people need help, then people need fucking help. Give them the help they need. No no more of this stupid hoop jumping and means test. Fuck your means testing. Fuck means testing. And people need the help that they- and People can tell you what they need help with. They don't need you to tell them for them. Like, it's like, I- Me? You know what I could use a whole lot of? If I if I could retreat somewhere, if I could have a safe space somewhere and retreat and just be allowed to do that, I would be able to do a lot more. But it's mm -hmm. this pigeonholing, and I've spent all of my life pigeonholed in what feels almost like a cage and not being able to get out. So now the very idea of it, I'm already starting to hyperventilate. Uh, <laughs> it, it puts me on panic attacks, like... And that's it. That's, I mean, that's not it, but that's like the major thing I can think of. And capitalism is so strict and iron fist in its control that it can't even allow these tiny things because, you know, it, it's all about the profit. And I and think it's, it's all about reducing people's rights. Right. And then, too, it's like, because well, we could hire you, or we could hire this one other person who's more capable and run them like freaking workhorse to death and because we need less people. Because here's the important thing to remember about profits. It's not the, it's not the same as just making money. If the person made a dollar today, they need to make two dollars tomorrow. If they make two dollars tomorrow, they need to make three dollars the next day. Etc, etc, etc. And you might be thinking, hmm... That doesn't sound sustainable. Well, hmm, it's not. America has had, like, a lot more crashes than we advertise. The American rule book that I read talks about this. But, you know, we, we can't advertise the amount of times that the American economy has actually crashed. Because, hmm, maybe people will get the idea that maybe capitalism isn't a good idea. It's not. And I want to say, too, that... There are people who need a lot more help, and I, I also don't want to poo-poo the, like, the idea of some people who, There are people with autism who, at a moment's notice, if, if, you, would, if you could give them a magic cure, they would probably take it. And yeah, There's a lot of people who find it a ball and chain rather than a part of themselves that's inseparable. Right, and you can't blame them too much with what we have talked about today. But I have to ask you... How much of this stuff is actually because of autism, and how much of it is actually because of the systems of oppression? Especially, particularly, our current systems right. of oppression, too. Like, we, we, we were talking about this uh, a while ago, um, and, you know, the current systems of oppression that we have underneath capitalism, underneath the 9 to 5, underneath all of that, all of that's new. Like... Not, the nine to five work week is like a hundred years old, if that, and capitalism in the idea that we know it, maybe 200, 300. And then like before that, like we don't have an accurate depiction of how autistic people were treated. Like earlier on, like you've got, you know, stories and tales of like the weird people in the woods or like, you know, old Tommy who, you know, doesn't do a whole lot, but, you know, you have the current systems that we have are particularly regimented and particularly designed in such a strict way that is just not conducive to a significant portion of the populace just because it was designed by people who weren't taking into consideration anyone else. Right, and going with what we talked about off here, this whole idea of thinking outside the box. Yeah. Because of 
single man moving history, we have these ideas that these certain individuals moved history along, even though that's bullshit because they stood upon the backs of everybody else and they probably had more help than people write down about. But it's interesting, though, that a lot of these super geniuses seem to have been neurodivergent somehow. And that leads to the whole idea that th the box, right? It's like, oh, we need to think outside the box. What is the box? Right. The box is the ruling class's idea of how you should think, how you should act. It's the idea of how you should behave and act in society, even. It's what is acceptable. And mind you, I'm talking generally here. And... If you, if you go too far outside this box, you'll be punished. But if you look just enough like the ruling class, or behave just enough like the ruling class, then you could be considered a super genius and quote-unquote be the one to push humanity forward. Mm -hmm. my, my point being, though, is I believe that autistic people and other neurodivergent people are part of a healthy society. Yes. The box shouldn't exist. There should not be a box to think in and outside of. Because... We are, we are not the problem. The box is the problem. Right. The box is a restrictive, like, just being down thing that's just mentally trapping us all. Right. Because just think about it. If you have a society that's like, raises up only a certain group of people, and only those certain group of people can have the ideas and make the decisions and think, like and push society forward. If it's only a certain type of people, you only have a certain way of thinking about doing things. Like, and that's nothing against these people inherently. That's just how life works. If you only have a, if you only have a hammer, everything's going to be a nail. And that's what this is. And so you get someone in there who's like, hmm, what if we used a screwdriver? Holy shit, suddenly it's revolutionary. And that's how we've existed, because we refuse to allow other people to exist, and to exist fully. And mm -hmm. my main point in all of this is that, like, I feel like maybe before we start looking for magic cures for autism and shit like that, maybe we should treat them well first. Yes. I know, radical idea, but that's what we do here on, on HedgePod is have radical ideas like treat neurodivergent people well so that maybe, just maybe, they'll live past the expiration date. And by expiration date, I mean the low numbers of adult autistic people because they die before they get there. Yeah. But, and as far as media and stuff is concerned too, hire autistic writers and consultants like that that's how you fix this shit <laughs> like if, if you want better depictions of autistic people in media hire them please not that hard i think that about wraps it up Do you, did you have anything else you wanted to add or share i uh, the only thing that i've had on my brain the whole time is that uh, similarly to what we were talking about before about you know suddenly there's a screwdriver and suddenly you know you're a genius um, the same thing, uh, at least, has been anecdotally seen in, like, gender communities as far as, you know, how transgender people, like, at least, especially with trans femmes, it has been anecdotally seen as higher, uh, higher levels of ASD. Um, and part of the leading theories there is that, you know, being ASD, not being a, not being able to follow the system, questioning the system, and you know, not understanding the system means that hey, wait a second, this whole gender nonsense doesn't make any fucking sense. Mm -hmm. Like, why is this a thing? Why is this a part of our system? Because it, like you know, it's been a longer running part of our system, and for a lot of people, it's very hard to question that. But for a lot of people in the LGBT community, LGBTQ plus community, like it's, you know, something that is questioned and can be questioned because, you know, hey, this other stuff, you know, didn't check out, you know, being straight and stuff. What about the rest of this stuff? Right. Like it's all part of that negative system. And I think it's interesting how 
the stereotype for an autistic person is a straight white boy because it, it seems to be a thing that if you are on the autism spectrum, you're probably in the queer community. Like, mm -hmm. it it's a thing. Hi, I'm one of them. Like, and hi, also, yeah, it, it's it's a thing. Like, um, and it's yeah, it's certainly not a complete Venn diagram, but it's definitely huge overlap. Yeah, that's not to say that everyone who is in the LGBT plus community is autistic. It's it's more the other way around that you're more likely to be in the LGBT plus community if you're also autistic. Yes. I think that's it. Um, I will end on this saying once again, after everything that we've talked about, listen to autistic people. Like, listen. Like, listen. <laughs> Give them the space, hear their stories, like, understand that their struggles are different from yours. Like, if someone tells you, yeah, this loud space is really fucking with me, it's probably really fucking with them. Mm -hmm. And with that, I think we're going to wrap this up. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, bye. See y'all.